if you practice meditation consistently, you're practicing what the teachings call being awake. And uh, what, what they mean by being awake is that you, you could say being present, or being aware, so that you're no longer living your life in what the teachings call a dream state, a dream state. And what they mean by a dream state is that uh, you're living your life according to uh, uh, the thought process. You're living your life according to what you think and how you feel. And because you're living your life according to what you think and how you feel, what you think and how you feel determines what you do. Right? It's, it's pure mathematical, right? If I'm living my life according to what I think and how I feel, my behavior equals what that tells me to do. So that's the, that's the story of, uh, of most human lives. And it's not a pretty picture because that means you can't do anything you don't feel like doing. So that eliminates most of, that limin, eliminates a lot of what works. It eliminates a lot of, eliminates doing a lot of what works. If you don't feel like exercising, you can't exercise. If you don't feel like eating the proper foods that your body needs for nutrition, or you don't think that you should because your thoughts are a function of your desire, your thoughts are a function of what you like to eat, what tastes good, then that determines your life. And so your life is not about what works, your life is about what you feel and what you think. And part of what you think is that you're this physical body, and part of what you think is that you're the thinker of the thoughts that occur in your mind. And because that's the case, you suffer. So one of the things the teachings tell us that the practice is about is to end suffering. And what is the suffering? See, one of the problems that exists for humanity is that humanity is unaware of the suffering that it's experiencing because the way humanity relates to life is that life is a pursuit of happiness. Life is a pursuit of peacefulness. Life is a pursuit of well-being. And so it doesn't appear to most people that they're suffering because they're chasing their experiences that they want in terms of being happy and peaceful and satisfied. They're chasing that. And the way things occur in a typical human life is, you know, you, you chase things that you want, you get it, it doesn't last long, and then you're dissatisfied again, so you start to chase again. And then you get it, it doesn't last long, and, and so you start to chase again. It could be chasing for the right relationship. It could be chasing for the right amount of money. It could be chasing for the right appearance in terms of your body. It could be chasing for the right job. It could be, you know, if you really stop and examine your life, when you get up in the morning, you're in the pursuit of happiness. When you get up in the morning, you look at your day in terms of what am I going to get that I want today? What do I want out of life today? So I know what to chase today. You know, I'll chase certain desserts for dinner. I'll chase certain foods that I like to eat. You know, I'll chase being uh, able to uh, avoid uh, having to work too much. You know, this is the typical human life. And because there is, you know, because there is a, a series of gratifications, it doesn't occur to uh, most human beings that this is a life of suffering. Uh, because it is, n there's never a consistent experience of satisfaction. The pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of peace, the pursuit of pleasure, avoiding pain, you know, avoiding uh, the, the things in life that we don't want to think about or that we don't want to feel. Life becomes about that. So, if you study these teachings, the teachings will, um, will uh, allow you to begin to understand what's going on. The first noble truth that Buddha talked about is life is suffering. 
and I was talking to one of my clients uh, yesterday about this, and he said, I don't understand what that means, life is suffering. I don't see how life is suffering. And that's because that statement, that first noble truth, life is suffering, was not to mean that life itself is suffering, no. What it means is the way people live life is suffering. That's what the Buddha meant when he said life is suffering. Life is suffering when you are living in a constant state of dissatisfaction. In Buddhism, they call it dukkha, you know, this constant state of satisfac dissatisfaction. One way to look at this and talk about it is to say, if you start to pay attention to your mental activity, to the mental process and to your emotional states, if you start to be awake and pay attention to that, right, you'll start noticing that the life of the mind, the life of the thought process, is in a constant ongoing process of this isn't it. It's a constant ongoing process of this isn't it. It's a constant process of comparing the way it is for you to the way you want it to be and noticing that this isn't it. You know, I want to be happy, but I'm, I'm not really happy. Uh, I want to be satisfied, but I'm not really satisfied. I want to be peaceful, but I'm not really peaceful, right? And so as you go through the day, the way this keeps occurring happens moment to moment, you know? You know, when you're in your car, you know, you want to be home, but you're not home yet. And there are people in your way to get there, so that becomes an upset, right? Or <clears throat> if you just start to pay attention, you'll see dissatisfaction is the consistent reality that we're experiencing all the time. Hmm? You know, I want to feel different than I feel. You know, I want to look different than I look. I want to have more than I have. I want my wife to stop being the way she is. I want my kids to be different. You know, I want my life to be different, right? So this is the, this is the life we're living day after day. And we don't see it as suffering because of the casino, what I call the casino effect. You, you win just often enough to keep you in the game. And you don't see it as suffering because you're getting gratification just often enough to keep you believing that you can win at some point. You can beat the house. Well, anybody that understands how casinos work understands that that's not possible. It's not set up that way. You can't beat the house. Right? So, the solution is to learn about the possibility of being awake. Learn about the possibility of discovering your true nature, discovering who you are. This is what the teachings teach, whether you talk about it in terms of Christianity, whether you talk about it in terms of Buddhism or Sufism or Judaism. All the major belief systems, all the major religions, when you look at their most fundamental teachings, the mystical teachings, are teaching basically the same thing, that it's possible to be free from suffering in this life. In Christianity, they talk about this possibility as dying and going to heaven, right? But then they also say the kingdom of heaven is on earth. So they're not referring to the afterlife, they're referring to a possibility that exists now to be free from this condition that we're living in so we can experience what it would be like to stop suffering, what it would be like to stop wanting what I don't have. And when you wake up and start paying attention, right, you start to undo this suffering process because you, you're seeing it now. You're awake to it now. You know, when the Buddha, well, you know, when the Buddha woke up, you know, they call that the word Buddha means awakened one. He woke up. It means I'm not sleeping anymore. When I'm crazy, I'm aware that I'm crazy. When I'm afraid, I'm aware that I'm afraid. When I want things I don't have, I'm aware that I want things I don't have, and this causes suffering. So now that I'm aware of that, I can be, begin practicing not continuing to go along with that thought process because it's torturing me, right? So when you wake up, you're practicing being awake. You're practicing paying attention to what's going on. You're practicing paying attention so that you can stop allowing yourself to be in this condition of dissatisfaction and realize <clears throat> that all you have to do to be happy in life is to let go of your idea that it should be different. 
That's what they mean when they say go with the flow, right? Stop resisting life. Let life be the way life is and allow yourself to, to flow with the way life is flowing instead of resisting it, instead of trying to control it, instead of trying to stop it. And that takes practice. You can learn about these things by studying the teachings, whether in, in, in whatever way you want to study the teachings. You can, and today you can study brain science. It's, brain science teaches the same thing, you know, that most of us have a crazy brain. And if you practice meditation, you can start training your brain to go sane by paying attention and watching the fact that <clears throat> because we know about neuroplasticity, if you're paying attention, you're watching yourself if you're being crazy, you're watching yourself give information to the brain that has it continue to function in a crazy way. You're watching yourself do that. And if you're watching yourself do that, you stop doing it, you stop going along with that process because you realize this is causing me suffering. That's insane to keep doing the same thing and expect different results, right? So then the question becomes, okay, if I study the teachings and I learn about this possibility, and the concepts make sense, sense to me, you know, if you read a lot of the current teachers out there, some of you who are as old as I am probably remember reading Alan Watts back in the day who was talking about what Zen was, right? Uh, or some of the other teachers that have come along. If you're as old as I am, you may have read Carlos Castaneda's books of Don Juan. All these things teach about this possibility that we all have as human beings to wake up and realize our true nature. And if we wake up and realize our true nature, we realize that our true nature is free. Our true nature is not a thought process. Our true nature is an awareness. It's not a thought activity, it's an awareness. And the awareness allows everything to be as it is. And so when you're experiencing yourself as the awareness instead of thinking that you're the thinker of the thoughts and caught up in this bad dream that you're having, you start to realize, oh, life isn't suffering. No, the suffering is a function of who I'm being and, and who I'm being when I think that I am this body and who I'm being when I think I'm this personality, who I'm being when I think I'm the thinker of my thoughts puts me in a world in which suffering is occurring. So the teachings tell us that and if you study the teachings and you read about these things, whether it's in brain science currently or some of the non-dual teachers that are around these days or some of the older people that have been around teaching these things, you'll see how convincing the teachings are because they point to the truth. They're irrefutable. When you really examine them, they're irrefutable. <clears throat> but the thing is this. And I'm sure there are a lot of you who are familiar with these teachings, who have looked into these matters and have uh, understood enough of the concepts to realize this possibility is real. It's a real, true possibility. But then the frustration that comes up is, well, I understand this. I understand who I am. I get it. I get the concepts of that. I get what the possibility is. I can see that it's real. And I want that possibility. I want to be free. I want to be happy. I want to be satisfied. But the understandings aren't providing that. The understandings provide the possibility, teach me about the possibility. This is something that I realized early on in my life when I was reading Alan Watts and reading a lot of other teachers and going to you know, the S training and doing retreats and, and studying yoga and all the rest of it. You know, It was very interesting and very inspiring and very attractive, this possibility, right? But the other side of that same coin was the frustration of not experiencing that, knowing about it but not experiencing that. That was, that was confusing to me, and it was very frustrating to me, and I'm sure it's frustrating to a lot of people who read about the possibility and understand what they're reading about and want to experience that but are not experiencing that. <clears throat> this is where meditation comes in, because what meditation is it's taking what you understand conceptually, and when you practice meditation, it's realizing it. Realizing it, not just knowing it, but realizing. Not just knowing what my true nature is, but realizing my true nature. In other words, being that, being that. Well, the only way I can be that 
is I've got to come out of this bad habit I have of thinking all day long and referring to the way I feel and the way I think as, as the way I live my life. I've got to come out of that in order to experience this. That's why when we practice meditation, what are we doing? We're, we're coming out of the thinking activity and being aware of the body breathing. And not only being aware of the body breathing, but if we keep practicing this over time, there's revelations occur. What do I mean by that? If you practice this over time, you start realizing, wait a minute, it's not just a matter of me being aware of the body breathing when I'm not in the thinking activity, but now the possibility starts to reveal itself to me that I am the awareness of the body breathing. It's not that I am aware of the body breathing. See, if I am aware of the body breathing, I'm still being a personality, thinking that as a personality, I am aware. But what, if you're paying attention, you begin to realize, wait a minute, there's awareness of the body breathing. There is no personality there. There is no thinking I am a person that is aware of the body breathing. It's just aware of the body breathing. So if you practice this long enough, it starts to dawn on you that your true nature is awareness itself. And that awareness that is your true nature is always available. It is the essence of your existence. Awareness is the essence of your existence. It is what you are. It's not something you have. You see, that's the shift. Most people think, oh, I am aware. It's something I have. A lot of, a lot of the brain, a lot of the scientists that haven't caught up with the truth yet think the brain is aware. That's what they say. They think the we can't prove it yet, right? But, but we think that once the brain becomes complex enough, awareness appears, right? Well, my direct experience, and I suggest to you that your direct experience, if you really look at it, is that your, your brain is in your awareness. It's not your awareness is in your brain. Your brain is in your awareness. I'm aware of a brain. I'm not a brain aware of, you know, of, of the world. So this shift, if this shift occurs through practice, then these concepts that you've learned about that offer the possibility start to be revealed and you start to actually be that instead of just know about it. You start to actually be that. And when you start being that, life starts being different. Because when you're being what you are, which is awareness itself, the nature of that awareness is that it's receptive, it's unlimited, it has wisdom, it's satisfied, it's peaceful, that's its nature. It's that way right now. You don't have to pursue it. It's that way right now. All you have to do is practice experiencing yourself as the awareness. That's what you're practicing when you practice meditation, experiencing yourself as the awareness. Now, it takes time. This is the challenge. It takes time for the body to practice being relaxed, and it takes time for the mind to calm down enough for there to be enough of an opening for you to actually see things as they are. It takes time for that. Why? because you've got years and years and years of habitually identifying yourself as the thinker of your thoughts, and I, years and years and years of identifying yourself as the, as the physical body. But the reality of it is what it is. If I can be aware of the body breathing, right? Now watch, if you're aware of the body breathing, <coughs> can you be the body? <coughs> If I'm aware of my hand, am I my hand? Yeah. If you're aware of something, there must be a distance between you and that which you're aware of, yes? Well, if I'm aware of my body, that means that whatever this awareness is, it's not this, it's aware of this. It's not this, it's aware of this, right? So therein lies a major process of shifting things through practice, through the consistent being aware of your true nature. Why? So that you can deal with the single most threatening aspect of being a human being. And what is that? What's the single most threatening aspect of being a human being? 
When you were born, that threat was born. Yeah. The single most threatening aspect of being a human being is death. The end of you, right? The end of you. Right? So what these practices are promising us is that if you do the practice consistently, if you can maintain the patience and the diligence necessary to do these practices consistently, you can come out of that bad dream. You can wake up and realize that my true nature is this awareness of the body, not the body. Now that's going to take practice because our identification with the body is so fundamental, isn't it? Yeah, it's so fundamental. We believe we are this, and because we have an awareness that is uh, introceptive, because we have an awareness of the interior aspects of the body, yeah, isn't that one of the reasons that we feel that we are this? Right? Well, just because you're aware of something, that doesn't make you that thing. First, you have to break up the misunderstanding, and then if you stay with the process, and you continue doing the practices, right? You complete the circle, right? You come to the understanding that awareness, the awareness, the consciousness that we are is all that there is. That's all that's happening. Right now, you know, your orientation, your conditioning says, I'm here, you're there. Your conditioning says, I'm here, the world's there, right? But just try on the possibility that this awareness that you're experiencing right now, right, the field of awareness, that your visual field, right, that everything is occurring in that visual field, is it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we could call that visual field the, uh, the field of awareness, right? And we think that that field of awareness uh, really is a, a real world that we're separate from. Hmm? But if you stay with these practices long enough, you actually begin to see that this field of awareness that you're experiencing is all there is. You know, one of the things my Zen teacher says about this is he says that we think we're seeing the world, right? But in reality, all you're seeing is the retina. Don't forget what's happening is the data, the light is coming into the eye, right? And then the, the eye is transmitting signals to the brain, right? And the brain is generating a visual appearance, is it not? Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're, only, you're only ever seeing the retina. You're only ever hearing the ear, eardrum, right? We believe that the eardrum is hearing a sound out here in the world, right? But there's no evidence for that. We believe that the eyes are seeing a world that's out here that we're, that we're separate from. There's no evidence for that. The reality of it is you're seeing your retina. That's all you're seeing. Your eyes still exist. That's right. So yeah, there. that's right. So the awareness is still there, right? The awareness will always still be there because it is the constant. It is that which is unchanging. It is that which is your true nature. So the teachings are the inspiration. You know, the teachings say, look, you, wanna, you want an answer to, to life? You, know, you, want, you wanna understand the possibility that's available for you as a human being to be free and happy and satisfied, everything you really ever wanted, you want that? So if you study the teachings, the teachings, especially if you study some of the teachings like the Advaita Vedanta teachings, right? Where they go into tremendous amount of detail to make it so obvious to you that the truth is true. Right? Why? To inspire you to want to experience that truth. But in order to do that, you have to practice meditation. And if you practice meditation, these understandings become realized. They become realized. They're, a, a realization is a revelation. When you, when, you, when you spend enough time out of the thought process, you see what's really happening instead of what you thought was happening. You spend enough time outside of the thought process, you experience who you are instead of who you thought you are. It's a different world, it's a different reality, and it's a reality that works. You learn how to be in the world in a way that works, in a natural way, and if you wake up, you start paying attention, just by paying attention, because you're awake, you can start seeing how the mind is 
operating with a mistaken identity, operating with a mistaken understanding about life. And as you see that in real time playing, right, you no longer are involved with it, you're no longer interested in it because you understand this is a facsimile. You know what a facsimile is, right? Yeah, it's, it's not the, th the real thing, it's a copy. It's not the real thing, it's an interpretation of the real thing, right? It's like one of the teachers used to say, it's like eating the menu at a restaurant instead of eating the food, right? If you want to experience life, actually experience life, you have to stop thinking about it and be present to the experience of life. If you want to experience what's possible in terms of who you are, you have to stop thinking about it and be available to the experience of who you are, which means be available to the experience of awareness itself. How hard can that be? It's available all the time, 24-7, it's available all the time. All you have to do is start training yourself to stop paying attention to what's not real and start paying attention to what is real. Hmm? And if you do that consistently, if you can remember to do that consistently when you wake up in the morning and during the day, you'll gradually come out of the dream and into the real world. And when you do that, you'll notice that your true nature, the way your true nature is, is it just allows everything to happen the way it's happening. No resistance. No rejection and no resistance. So when, when, so, so that when you, when you, and when an emotion comes up, you feel it. It's natural, you feel it. It doesn't even occur to you not to feel your emotions. But when you're living in a thought process and an, and an emotion comes up, I don't like it. I don't want it. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be sad. Like that, right? So your life becomes a push-pull operation. I want more of what I want and less of what I don't want. That's the life I'm living all the time. So meditation is a way of practicing coming out of the dream and having the concepts that you can study in the teachings be realized so that you're actually living a true life, living a real life, living life as what you actually are. That's what's available. So I really encourage you to study the practices. And for example, they talk about in the Advaita Vedanta teachings, right? The famous statement they make in those teachings is, anybody remember it? The, what, the, the fatal no, the, the, the one-liner from the Advaita Vedanta, you should know that. Well, that's because there isn't anything more than that. <laughs> it's sat, shit, ananda, right? And the Advaita Vedanta teachings, they say that sentence is the expression of the truth. I exist, I am consciousness, I am happy. That's the whole teaching, right? And of course, they break it down into explaining exactly how that is true and how that is real, right? But then having learned that, you have to then do the practice so that you can realize it and start to experience it. In the beginning of practicing meditation, it's like rote. It's like when you were a little kid in school and you're doing the ABCs and the times tables, it's just over and over and over again, right? It's a, it's a hassle to just keep repeating this over and over and over again. And because we're so impatient, we learn to be impatient, right? So we're sitting in meditation and if we don't experience this possibility of being awake, you know, if I don't get turned on, right? If I don't get turned on soon enough, right, then uh, this, this product isn't worth my time. You know, I want something quicker than that. Give me some psychedelics, you know. <laughs> I want something quicker than that. The only problem with psychedelics is it gives, psychedelics can offer you a glimpse, right, but after it's over, you're right back in, and when you're right back in, it could be worse than it ever was now because you had a taste. You had a taste of reality, but you couldn't stay there. If you practice meditation, you will gradually open up, right? You will gradually open up to this truth and begin to experience it until there's enough consistency in your experience, right? That you could say, I am happy. I'm just happy. So then you start to become aware that you're aware. You become aware that you are the awareness, right? And even if that happens in terms of glimpses as you practice meditation, right? you start understanding, oh, this is fundamentally the reality of what I am. Mm. And then instead of just practicing it in formal meditation, right, I start paying attention during the day 
to that fundamental reality of what I am as it compares to the thought activity which is telling me I'm something other than that. And that's where the suffering is.